Good morning again, everyone. We're now in the second week of our message series that we're calling The Mysteries of Faith. If you're joining us for the first time or the first time in a long time, welcome. And let me just take a moment or two to bring you up to speed with what we are trying to talk about. Each Sunday following the consecration of the bread and the wine, the priest sings, sometimes off-key, the mystery of faith. But how often do we stop to think about what those words mean? What is a mystery of faith? Mysteries of faith are truths that are hidden in God. Truths that cannot be known unless they are revealed by God. Mysteries of faith are not made up mythology, but realities that God knows to be true. Truths that God shares with us and truths that he makes known to us. Things that are true, whether you believe them or not. St. Augustine said, understanding is the reward of faith. Therefore, seek not to understand that you may believe, but believe that you may understand. Believe that you may understand. Put another way, mysteries of faith aren't Mysteries of faith are not truths that that we so much can take hold of, but rather mysteries of faith are truths that take hold of us, that shape our way of thinking and being and, and impact our actions. Today the church celebrates the great feast of Pentecost when 50 days after Easter, the Holy Spirit descended on St. Mary and the Apostles. Pentecost is often called the birthday of the church because from this point after Pentecost onward, the Apostles were empowered by the Holy Spirit to go forth and proclaim the good news as well as establish communities of faith throughout the Roman Empire and beyond. I think this is an important thing for us to grasp. The church is the creation of the Holy Spirit. It was an act of God, the sending forth of the Holy Spirit. The church began with God. It didn't begin with us. The church wasn't sort of born in a boardroom where a group of men tried to draft a a constitution and, and work out a business plan. No, the Catholic Church was not created by human beings, nor does it continue to exist by human effort alone. I think I've told this story before, so if you've listened to it, just humor me. (laughs) I only have so many stories. Um, In sixth grade, my homeroom and religion teacher was Sister Susan at at Sacred Heart in Kingston. I don't remember a lot from sixth grade, but I do remember a couple of lessons that Sister Susan taught us. And, And one of them was a lesson about the church, and I remember it quite clearly. Sister Susan told us that the church was both human and divine. She told us that the church was perfect in her humanity because that was the part that came from God, and that the church was imperfect in her humanity, because that was the part that came for us. And I remember her using the word mystery, and she said it's a mystery because they both go together. It's funny, I didn't think of that at the time, of course, but she was teaching us children about a mystery of faith. All of us know too well the pain and the suffering that have come from the imperfect human part of the church. And that's why we need to continually pray to the Holy Spirit for the purification 
of the Holy Spirit, for the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and then when the Holy Spirit begins to work, we have to step out of the way. In fact, that's why the Holy Spirit, I think, is associated with fire. Because fire purifies and cleanses. One time when I was in seminary, I was on a retreat, and the priest was talking to us about how we had to have the right motivations if we were going to put ourselves forward for ordination. And then he he said to us something kind of striking. I think he meant to be dramatic, and it worked. He said, if you're not here for the right reasons, I hope the Holy Spirit smokes you out. I remember thinking to myself somewhat uncomfortably, I'm here for the right reasons, right? You see, last week we talked about this, but we said that um, being engaged in the lifelong process of, of growing in likeness to of likeness to God and growing in grace. We call that sanctification. Growing in likeness to God and and growing in grace. And each of us, that's me and that is you as individuals, need to be engaged in this lifelong process because it is the only way, the only way that our big church, as well as our small part of it called Ascension, can get better. It depends entirely on our sanctification. Now consider this. Today in this country, as well as around the world, Catholics everywhere profess the words of the Nicene Creed. We'll say it together in a few minutes. It was composed in the year 381 to express the central mysteries of our faith. We say it every Sunday. Maybe you've wondered why, if it expresses the central mysteries of our faith, why doesn't it include everything? It doesn't talk about the Eucharist. It doesn't talk about purgatory or so much else. And the reason for this is that when it was formulated, it was a baptismal creed. It was meant to be a summary of the things that an adult would need to know if they were going to receive baptism. All of the other instruction, that would all have come later. Towards the end of the creed, we acknowledge the four characteristics or the four marks of the church. One, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. The first mark of the church is that it is one. The Holy Spirit draws us together in unity. On Pentecost, the disciples with St. Mary were united in prayer. And this continues today. I mean, Catholics all around the world gathered into the one big church under the leadership of the Pope. The second mark of the church is that it is holy. Before we share the sign of peace, We say, Lord, look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. Even in our brokenness, even in our frailty, even in our sinfulness, the church continues to be an instrument of holiness. We see this in the big saints whom we have churches named after, but we also see this in the ordinary saints who we rub shoulders with every day. And I will tell you for a fact, there are many seated right here. Not saying you're perfect yet, but we're good and we're under construction. The third mark of the church is that it is Catholic. Now, when I say Catholic, I don't mean Catholic with a big C. I mean Catholic with a small C, a little C. And Catholic with a little c means universal. You see, the good news isn't just meant for a select few. It's meant for all. On the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, there were people from all over. 
They spoke different languages, they were of different races, they were of different ethnicities. But each of them heard in their own language, expressing the universality for everybody of the church. The fourth mark of the church is that it is apostolic. Christ founded the church on his apostles. And we are connected to the apostles because everything that we believe today as Catholics was believed by and taught by the apostles, at least in seminal form. And through the power of the Holy Spirit present in the sacraments, there is an unbroken chain that links us back to the apostles who were commissioned by Christ himself 2,000 years ago. We call this apostolic succession and it is handed on from bishop to bishop, an unbroken chain. I think it's easy for most of us to accept that God created us to know him, to love him, and to serve him and then to be eternally united with him in the next. But it is an amazing mystery, and maybe even a little harder to grasp, that Jesus has given us a perfect and an imperfect church as a necessary instrument for our salvation. And, and maybe, maybe just as amazing and maybe hard to grasp is the fact that God has entrusted us, again, you and me, with the church and with the salvation of others. But maybe we, we, we shouldn't be surprised too much because we think of St. Paul. St. Paul had a kind of a bad background. But God chose to use him nonetheless. And then, and then reflecting on this and, and writing, St. Paul said, we hold this treasure in earthen jars or earthen vessels. Another translation says cracked pots. And sometimes it's clear that we're cracked pots. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing mystery. We can't do it on our own, but even in our brokenness, the Holy Spirit flows through. And that's why God sent the Holy Spirit to come to aid us in our weakness. There's a lot of uncertainty about what the church is going to look like after the pandemic. But one thing is certain. It is certain that the Holy Spirit has a hand in all of it. The Holy Spirit is going to guide and direct everything, even in spite of ourselves. From the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost until today, the Holy Spirit is active, alive, and at work. And like the apostles, we are called and sent forth by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the good news that Jesus is Lord to people who so desperately need it. A few weeks ago, we said that you might be the only Jesus that someone ever meets. Think of it another way. You might be the presence, the only presence of the church that someone ever meets. How can you be that presence to someone else? Well, we can't do it on our own, so let's pray. Come Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and our minds Strengthen us, strengthen our church for the work that you have called us to do. 
Help us to proclaim the good news that Jesus is Lord to those who so desperately need to hear it. And cleanse and purify. Cleanse and purify your church and our parish. Come, Holy Spirit.